Okay, chemical equilibrium. Um, here we have the definition of equilibrium. It's when you have two systems that have opposing uh, processes occurring at the same rate. Okay, so an example of that would be the forward and the reverse reaction are happening at the same time and at the same rate. The same rate doesn't necessarily mean they're making the same amount of product, okay, or the same amount, or they have the same concentrations when they're at equilibrium, but they're happening at the same rate. So an example of that would be, um, has anybody ever had or seen the little terrariums that are like the enclosed ecosystem that you never have to add any water to or food or whatever, it's all enclosed and everything in there just kind of keeps existing because it's, an it's a closed system, that system is in at equilibrium with itself in terms of water evaporating, water condensing, okay? Um, another reason, for instance, that uh, especially here in the south in Texas, when it gets zero degrees outside, everybody starts panicking and thinks the whole world's going to freeze over at zero degrees Celsius um, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, that's what they like to think in, in the United States, and they think, ah, oh, it's 32 degrees, it's going to freeze. It doesn't actually freeze over at 32 degrees because, this caught you all on some of that test, at the same time you are freezing water at zero degrees Celsius, what are you also doing with water at zero degrees Celsius? Celsius. You're melting. You have those processes happening at the same rate, freezing and melting, when you are at that phase change temperature. If you get well below zero degrees, obviously all of, everything freezes, or if you're well above, everything melts. But at that phase change, you have that equilibrium process going on of freezing and melting at the same rate, which is why it seems like nothing's happening. Okay? So when a process is at equilibrium, it does seem like nothing's happening. But on the atomic or molecular level, you've got these opposing processes happening at the same time. It just makes it appear as if nothing's happening. Okay? Your notes say all reactions are, rever are reversible. I would like you to put in almost all reactions are reversible. Uh, there are some reactions that are not reversible, uh, and so I don't want you to think that they all are. For instance, what's, can you think of one that's not reversible? Burning. Burning a tree, right? Can't get it back. Dying tends to not be reversible. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so re most, almost all reactions are reversible under the right conditions, but there are some that are not, okay? We use this double-headed arrow to represent that a system is at equilibrium or that it is a reversible reaction. Um, and then the forward direction is when we say it's forward or we say to the right, it's going to the right, that's favoring the products or it's going towards the products. The reverse reaction is towards the reactants or we call that left, right? Because here's an equation, right products, left reactants, okay? So at equilibrium, that rate of the forward is equal to the rate of the reverse, okay? The rate has nothing to do with the concentration, so don't make that confusion. Don't think that because it's at equilibrium that there's equal concentrations of products and reactants. That's not the case. It's just that they're happening at the same rate. All right. For example, here we have a solution of sugar that's been dissolved. Um, for Grins, let's go back and remind ourselves what kind of solution would that be if I've got crystals in the bottom that are not dissolving? Saturated. You are correct. Yeah. It is a saturated solution. And what's happening here is the sugar at the bottom is continuing to dissolve while the sugar at the top, because it's a saturated solution, is continuing to crystallize out. And those are ha So it looks like nothing's happening. Looks like we just got some sugar sitting in the bottom. But in fact, some is still redissolving and some is recrystallizing. And that is happening at an equilibrium rate. Oh, so if you took, like, the sugar from, like, the top, would it taste like sugar? Like, would there still be sugar in there? Or would it, be it would bad? still taste like sugar. I mean, it wouldn't taste any different. But really and truly, and of course, it's just along the top of that sugar. The sugar at the bottom is not being dissolved. But these are still dissolving, but then the one that's dissolved are recrystallizing because you're at that saturation point. Okay? If you were unsaturated, then you would not be at equilibrium. You could still dissolve more. Okay? All right. So, some reactions favor the forward reaction uh, more than the other side, and some will favor the reverse reaction, um, resulting in a higher concentration of one or the other. Okay? So, for this example, we know based on its equilibrium constant that it's the forward reaction is favored. It's already drawn correctly on your paper, so sometimes we'll draw that as a one arrow bigger than the other one. But generally, we, don't, we show that this way, but generally we know the K value, which we're fixing to talk about, and that tells you which direction the equilibrium lies. Okay? All right. 
So, concentration of reactants and products, substance, we're going to look at this reaction. So, if we have this reaction, A plus B yields C plus D, the little letters are your coefficients in the balanced equation, okay? Um, and so, when we're looking at this, initially, before we start this reaction, we initially assume that C and D are zero, because we have not reacted them together yet. And initially, we assume that A and B are at their maximum concentration for this particular reaction, because we haven't started it. Once we react them, of course, the concentration of the reactants is going to go down, because we're reacting them and forming products. But at the initial level, we're assuming C and D are zero. That's going to be important in some of our calculations later. And that the A and B are at their maximum at that time, initially. Okay. So here is something new called the equilibrium constant. And just to keep it fun and exciting, a big K is the equilibrium constant, whereas little k is rate constant. Okay? Yeah. So um, yeah, I don't know who came up with all these letters and said why. Do, same thing when we did molarity as a big M and molality as a little m. I'm like, why couldn't we come up with some other letters? But okay. So here is how we calculate that. Um, so if we had that A plus B yields C plus D, it looks like this. Okay. Um, basically, it's, I want you to write this down, because basically K is equal to products raised to their coefficients over reactants. So it's always going to be products over reactants. And of course, the number one mistake is flipping them and putting reactants on top. When we were doing delta H calculations, and it was products minus reactants, what do you think the number one mistake was on the test? Reactants minus products. You've got to have them in the right spot. So products on top, reactants on bottom. Okay? Um, if you know your concentration, uh, your equilibrium constant, you can actually um, know which direction that lies. Okay? Here's the cool thing about big K as opposed to little k. So in little k, we were very concerned with our units, right? We had, like, based on what order it was, it had different units, blah, blah, blah. Here's the cool thing about big K. No units. Don't have to worry about units on the K. You do have to worry about them if I'm asking you to solve for a concentration, because it's going to be molarity. But when you're calculating K, there is no units. So that's cool. Okay? All right. So let's talk a little bit about that. Oh, well, first of all, if I showed you the formula, what are we going to do with that? We are going to solve some stuff, yes. Yes, we're going to solve some stuff, okay? So <clears throat> here we have this reaction. Nitrogen plus oxygen yields NO uh, nitrogen monoxide, okay? So first thing we're going to do is we're going to write our equilibrium expression. So K is equal to NO raised to the second because it's got the coefficient of 2 over N2 and O2. They gave us the concentrations in the problem, so now we're just going to plug that in. So 1.1, there's NO right there, times 10 to the negative fifth, raised to the second, over N2, oops, not N2, let's actually put the number in there, uh, N2, N2 is 6.4, times 10 to the negative 3, and 1.7 times 10 to the negative 3. So we're going to do that math, so throw that in your calculator. And this is probably the only time in all of my years of calculating a K value that I get the same K value as what my concentration was of the product, which is weird. I, I did this like two or three times to make sure I didn't put it in my calculator wrong, and I didn't. And first period also calculated it with me, and it comes out the same. I'm like, something's not right, but it just happens to be that way. Yeah, and for that particular problem. Because it kind of, I thought, did I not do the math? And then I did. So y'all double check me too, because first period, they someone got 1.01, 1 .01, so I thought, oh, I got it messed up. But then they went back and saw that they hadn't squared the top. Okay? That's exactly what I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay? So that's how you do the calculations. Yes. So I get, like, how we find K, but, like, what is the significance of K? Like, what is it? I'm glad you asked. Let's continue forth. Okay. It's like I paid you to make that comment to segue me into the next section. Good job. 
Okay, about the equilibrium expression constant. What does this mean for us? First of all, equilibrium is always temperature dependent. Okay, it depends on temperature. If I change the temperature, I change my equilibrium constant. Okay, it is temperature dependent. When we're doing our calculations for K, you only include things that are aqueous or gas. Okay, only aqueous or gas. So if I'm looking at a balanced equation, I have to pay attention to my states of matter. Okay, so only aqueous things and gaseous things. Okay, Kc is how we represent aqueous concentration. So if it's something that's aqueous, it's going to have a concentration because we dissolve something in water, so we're going to use Kc. Yes? When is water aqueous? Never? Water is never aqueous. Okay, okay, sorry. That's, I'm sorry. We're not going to start down that discussion of is water wet, but no, no. water is never oh, aqueous. Gosh. Water is liquid. It's a pure liquid. Water is pure water liquid. Water is always L. L for pure liquid, yes. Okay. okay. All right. Um, you can also represent partial pressures, and we usually refer to that as Kp. Kc for concentration, Kp for pressure. Okay. And it's the partial pressures of the gases. Okay. There are a whole lot of other equilibrium constants. We are only doing general. Oftentimes you'll see it like this too for Keq for equilibrium constant. Okay. But in here, we're only going to do general. We're only going to deal with concentrations, pressures, but mostly just concentrations. We are doing kinetics light, baby kinetics. Okay. I'm not kinetics, baby equilibrium. Okay. Um, and we will uh, do some rice table calculations, but it's more like baby rice cereal instead of true rice tables. Okay. Because um, I want to expose you to it. For those of you that go on to take AP Chem, you've, you've at least seen it before. Okay. Um, so there's KSP, which is a solubility product uh, for things that are insoluble. So you know how we told you that, like, we have those lists of solubility rules? And we told you, hey, they're not soluble. Guess what? We lied a little bit. They are slightly soluble. <laughs> Some of them will, solu will be slightly soluble. So there's a whole type of calculation for KSP for that solubility. And then there's equilibrium of acids and bases, and that's KA and KB. That tends to be the hardest unit or one of the hardest units in AP Chem is uh, acid-base equilibrium. So we're just going to tell you about those. We're not going to calculate any of those. We're going to stick to the general equilibrium on concentrations and pressures. Okay? Um, solids and liquids will never be included in the equilibrium expression. So if I had this balanced equation, solid going to a liquid and a gas, um, your K would only be the oxygen because it's the only gas. And they're, So solids and liquids do not have a concentration, do they? No. No. They're... They're all that. Okay. Uh, of course, we already know that brackets refer to concentrations. And the lower the K value, the higher the equilibrium concentration of the reactants. I have a better way to say this. I want you to write this down. And it is this. If K is less than 1, you're going to favor your reactants. If K is greater than 1, you favor your products, meaning you'll have more, a higher concentration of your products if you have a greater than 1 value. If you go back and look at what we said, it makes sense because it's products over reactants, right? So if your concentration of your products are favored, you're going to have a higher numerator, right? So you're going to have a K greater than 1. If your reactant concentration is favored, you're going to have a higher reactant, so your K value is going to be lower. Okay? K will never be negative, but it will have negative exponents. Like a while ago, we calculated 1.1 times 10 to the negative fifth. So which one would that favor? Uh, uh, reactants. Less than 1. Yeah, it's less than 1. It favors reactants. Yeah. Okay? All right. Moving on. Here we go. We're going to write the equilibrium expressions for the following. We're going to do. I'm going to. We're going to do Kc, and then I'm going to show you how you would write it if it were pressure. Okay. So we would say products over reactants, right? So Kc would be concentration of PCl3 times concentration of Cl2 over PCl5. Bracket. If we were doing Kp, we do not use brackets for pressure. 
write that down somewhere. You can either write it up there by KP, or you could write it here, but we do not use brackets for pressure. Okay? On an AP exam, they do not give them credit if they show KP with brackets. This year, they had that on one of their tests, and they did not get credit, and one of their quizzes, actually. And they didn't get the point for writing it correctly, because if you're using brackets for pressure, you're showing that you don't understand that those brackets mean concentration. So we would write P for pressure, and then we would do, like, sub CL3, the pressure of CL2. We can draw it, multiply, yeah. And then P, uh, P, P, C, L, 5. forgot the L. So it would look like that. If for some reason I am going to do it in a different color because I'm going to erase it, let's say one of those had to be squared, you would just do it like that. You can use parentheses if you want, if that makes you feel better, but do not use brackets. I say don't use parentheses because sometimes people's parentheses look like brackets or they start doing it and they automatically do brackets on, on a mistake. Okay? So I'm going to erase that because it's not really going there. Okay, so you guys do both KC and KC for the next one. Ready? There you go. All right. And I believe that's where we stop. The end for today. We'll, we'll pick up uh, shifting equilibrium and let Chatelier tomorrow.